Hello, everyone, and I want to welcome you back to Python Love Conference 2021. I'm really excited about our next talk. I was just speaking with Lily beforehand about the fact that we are looking at TypeScript for some things internally. So I'm excited to hear how they've done it at Sneak. So without further ado, I'll let Lily take over. But make sure after the talk, go down into the face-to-face -face if you want to ask questions and have some discussions with her after the talk. And we'll see you there. Um, ask any questions over in Slido or in Slack. I'll make sure I relay those to Lily as we go. All right, take it away, Lily. Working in a fast-paced environment can be very challenging. Customers are demanding new features in a timely manner. The support team is waiting on those bug fixes. And on top of it all, there's always tech debt to address and legacy code to maintain and refactor. Keeping it all running smoothly can feel like a game of Jenga, where if the first few moves left the tower with a wobbly foundation, adding or removing any new block on top could completely collapse the tower at any moment. In engineering, it is important to have a strong foundation so you can move fast and continuously deliver value to customers. We want to be able to release new features without breaking any existing functionality. But this could be a challenge, especially if that feature or a fix is in that legacy piece of code that we all avoid touching too much because it has hidden dangers and unknowns. This is where having really good tests can help you out and make you feel confident with every push to production. We want to be able to oh, lost my train of thought. <clears throat> this is where having excellent tests can really help you out and make you feel confident with every push to production. But what do you do if over time those tests became outdated, have some gaps, or simply don't cover enough of your core business flows for you to continuously rely on them? Well, this is where we've turned to TypeScript as one of the tools to help us. But making big changes across an organization with many engineering teams can be really difficult. At the time, we were six separate teams and we had over 200 repositories. So this was really going to be a challenge. I would like to share with you how we brought TypeScript to Sneak, how far did we get, and what are some of the lessons that we've learned along the, the way. But before we move on, let's make sure that we are all on the same page about what is TypeScript. TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, and that means that all JavaScript is valid TypeScript, and it brings optional static types to the language. Type errors are caught early during compilation or in your IDE before you've even run any code first. Let's take a look at an example. So here we have a function that reads a file from disk given a path to file. If the file doesn't exist, we're going to throw. Otherwise, we're going to read the file contents and return an object with properties, name, and text. And this is what it might look like with some basic types added in. We assert that the path to file is a string and that the file contents is also a string. And we could take this even further. We could type the, out, the output of this function as well using a TypeScript interface. So here we've created a file interface with properties name and text, and they're both a string. TypeScript has a variety of types to help us model many different situations. So let's take a look at just some of them. Let's say what we now want to initiate the file reading, and we want to be able to also record who initiated the action. So if the action was initiated because a user clicked something in the UI, we want to record the user. Otherwise, we want to record the organization instead. Now we can do this by using a union type, and we could say that the type action creator is either a user or an organization. Union types are useful where you may be returning multiple types from a function or maybe when the parameters that you take in are separate types. When using union types, only shared properties can be accessed. So here you can see that we can access the group ID because it exists on both the user and the organization. But when we try and get to the org ID, we get an error that property org ID does not exist on type user. 
So here we would have to tell TypeScript which type we're dealing with. And ideally you would do this um, with a type guard, but here I'm using the as keyword. And union types can be useful if a function may be doing a little bit too much and you kind of uh, want to start separating your concerns. Intersection type lets us combine multiple types into one. So if we had a function that, for example, validates all the possible options that we would take in during the file reading, we could separate the types, but then put them together in the options. So here we're saying that we support trim spaces or encoding, and we're saying that the options is both read file options and create file options. Again, this is very useful when refactoring. <clears throat> if you have a function that's doing too much, you can separate the types, and then that will really help you refactor it out later on. So one of my favorite features is the ability to have an interface inside another interface. <clears throat> Let's say now we want to be able to get the file contents or create a new file if it doesn't exist. So here we're getting the file contents. If that throws, we are going to create a new file and then we are going to also record whether the file was created or not. We can model this by using an interface called file res. <clears throat> and the function return here is created, which is a Boolean, and file, which is a file that we've already created previously. And TypeScript also lets you uh, define enums, which are essentially named constants, but they can also be used as types. So let's say we now, for the read file from disk example, we want to make sure that encoding is passed in as a variable to the read file sync function. We can create that as a parameter to this function. And we could also define the allowed properties that we support. And in this case, we're saying that we support base64 and UTF-8 only. So as soon as we've done that, we are actually going to get an error in the call site to this function. And that's because you've introduced a new mandatory parameter. So we need to go ahead and add in the encoding and you'll see that as soon as you have an enum and some other type values, you're going to get autocompletion. So you can choose from the allowed values. So what would happen if we try to add UTF-16, for example? As soon as we've done this, we're going to get an error. And it's going to say that argument of type UTF-16 is not assignable to parameter of type file encoding. And that's pretty neat. And it will go even further. And if this is the only code in your file, it's actually going to tell you that this function is not used at all. So you can go ahead and delete it. TypeScript can also infer types from its surrounding context or when the variables are initiated. So there is no need for extra verbose typing. So you can see here, we have created a variable, which is created and gave it the initial value of Boolean false. From then on, TypeScript will assume that the value must be a Boolean and therefore will complain if you try to assign something else. If the type needs to be multiple, then you would have to type this. And TypeScript also comes with many ID integrations, things like signature hints, code completion, refactoring, find uses, and so much more. And here we're using a third-party library called Semper. And because it has typings included, we're able to see all the available functions, and then all of the parameters that we can pass in as well. So after chatting about moving to TypeScript during our engineering weekly meetings, we decided that it would be best if we kind of jump straight in and that if the repo that we chose would be the one that would benefit the most from type checking. And this happened to be our biggest and oldest code base. And this isn't something that you would normally do when trying out something new, but it was so much legacy code around that we constantly had to rewrite and refactor. This was really going to give us the biggest return for our investment. Our initial estimate was only about a day for an application that was a, um, a mixture of TypeScript and JavaScript. And to do that, we needed to introduce a basic tsconfig.json file. And we've just used all the default parameters that the documentation recommends. 
However, the key one for us was to enable allow JS equals string. So we could have a hybrid application. And then we converted just the read level index.js to an index.ts so we could test the whole setup. And this is what that might look like. We essentially needed to update um, you know, our from vars to const and uh, our import styles. And that's because we've opted out for a newer JavaScript. And unfortunately, immediately we saw some things that just would not work for us. The structure of our code had to change. And that's because TypeScript builds everything into a disk directory. So we needed to move everything into a root level source directory. And that was quite easy to do, but it did generate a huge git diff. And then we were ready to try running our tests. And this is when we realized that unfortunately our testing tool tap doesn't actually support TypeScript. This was over a few years ago now. And unfortunately that meant for us that we needed to create a custom fork of tap and run our tests with TS node instead. And overall this was easy to do, but it did add an extra day to our estimations. So by the time we were ready to try again, tests were running, it was quite late on a Friday evening. And I mean, it was probably too late to merge things, but we do have a culture of merging things in uh, when tests pass and we were really excited. So we went ahead and merged it anyway. And things were looking good. There were no issues, no errors over the weekend, no alerts, nobody got woken up. However, we were horrified to find on Monday morning when we came in, that our incremental compilation was taking 10 to 14 seconds. And that's really, really slow and that really sucks. So we had to do a little bit of digging. And we found out that ECMAScript 2015, just like TypeScript, treat any file with a top level import and export as a module. And otherwise it is considered to be a, a script on the global scope. And unfortunately that completely invalidates the cache. So the fix for this wasn't going to be easy. We either had to go full on TypeScript or at least full on AS modules. So we really needed a battle plan. We basically needed to go from something that looks like this, with module.export and require, to something that looks like this. But we also had a bunch of code that was doing this. So this was going to be fun. Next steps were to start rolling out TypeScript to our many repos. So we needed to create a few simple guidelines to help us get there. So we decided that number one, we would convert all of our templates to TypeScript. Two, all of our new repositories would be TypeScript and we would convert existing ones as we go. Three, all new files are TypeScript and we will convert existing ones as we go. And lastly, we would keep track of our progress. So let's dive in a little bit deeper into what this meant for us. So if you have any templates at all, you'd want to convert those early on. So the next person that needs to create a new repository can get started on the right foot with TypeScript. And this is also a great opportunity for you to sort of think of what is my ideal repository? What are the tools that I want? What versions of things do I want to use? And we did exactly that. We use this as an opportunity to start using Jest instead of Tap. We've added Prettier, we've updated some of our linting rules and generally just bumped versions of dependencies. Once you have an easy way to create new repositories with TypeScript, the next challenge is to make sure that you're converting existing ones as you go. And we agreed that while planning for the next feature or a fix, we would provide a little bit more time uh, into our estimations to allow us to come into that area of code and refactor it first and convert it to TypeScript. And this may sound like a lot more work up front, but actually it's really helped us to move faster because once the code is in a better shape, it was easier to add changes to it and errors were simpler to spot as well. So this became a default practice on our team. And we've even developed sort of a couple of simple ways that we can try and do this incrementally. 
following the principles of incremental delivery. So we would initially first just convert the absolute bare minimum to TypeScript and enable allow.js, just like you saw. And then in a separate pull request next time, you might convert all the files with absolute bare minimum changes. And then in the same PR, or maybe even in the next one, you would add some basic types. And then you would continuously improve this as you go. And this is an example of what this might look like. So to convert just a bare minimum, it would essentially mean updating the package JSON and then adding a tsconfig.json. You might also need to update uh, something in your CI to make sure that there is a build step. And then you'd want to convert all the files if, you, if it's a very small code base. If it's just one file, five files in there, you might want to just do them all at once and make them .cs. Um, otherwise, you could do just the root level index .js converted to index.cs. And again, we're just updating the absolute minimum required to make TypeScript compile. And you might even want to relax some of the rules because you can tighten them up later on once you're ready. And then we would continuously improve this with every PR. So then next time I have a fix to make, I would first come in and maybe just update some syntax, maybe refactor away some of the dot end promise chains and then continuously improve this as I go. And all of these are really small changes. However, over time, they really, really add up. And there's a similar idea for the files. So if you have a really large repository, any new file, you'd make sure that it's always TypeScript. And for an existing file, you'd want to convert as you go. So you'd want to, <clears throat> Again, convert the file to .ts, but then with absolute minimum changes. And if you have time or if it's easy to do so, maybe add some basic types. But again, you would kind of gradually improve this with every single pull request rather than try and tackle it all at once. And last but not least, we wanted to keep track of our progress. That was very important to us. We wanted to make sure that we knew how we were doing. We knew how long it might take us overall. But also, it helped uh, spark a little healthy competition on the team as we were all racing to increase the percentage of TypeScript. So we created a, a very simple script. And about every week, we would post a little update in our Slack channel to sort of tell us how TypeScript we are. And this is what this might look like. It's a very basic script that kind of counts the number of TypeScript code lines versus JavaScript. About a year and a half in, we were finally able to remove Allow.js from our main application. And that was really great, because from then on, it meant that we could start tightening up those rules that perhaps we kind of skipped for now. So how did this go for us overall? So two years in, that's the migration happened in 2018. So two years in, this is what it looked like. We were about 65% TypeScript overall. That's with 71 out of 200 repos being 100% TypeScript. And then everything else was either a hybrid or still pure JavaScript. And we'll also manage to reduce the number of dot and promise chains, which were, we were tracking because we really wanted to get rid of them in favor of async await. And we got that down to about 30%. Our main application is 100% TypeScript. And with tests, that still is 100% TypeScript. However, our second biggest code base, which is our CLI, kind of leveled off at 90% TypeScript. And with tests, that drops to about 87%. And this is where we are today. We still have some repositories and some tests that are in JavaScript. And that's because we didn't have an opportunity to work in those repositories or tests in the last couple of years. We didn't want to just go in and convert things just for the sake of it. All of our new repositories are TypeScript, which is excellent. All of our new files and all of our new tests are TypeScript. And we've spent our time 
sort of tightening up the rules. And now we have quite strict rules across all of our code. So what benefits have we seen from using TypeScript otherwise? Well, as soon as you convert even one file to TypeScript, you start to see immediate benefits, even if you don't add any types at all, because TypeScript can infer those from context. You will start noticing unused variables, unused functions, parameters that are in the wrong order, tests that are using invalid mocks, function calls with invalid parameters. This was really eye-opening for us because it helped us find code that made us wonder, how did this ever work at all? But the most dangerous mistakes are the ones that made you think that the code did something that it, in fact, did not. And I'd like to share with you a couple of examples of what I mean by this. Let's say we often use this function, calculate bill tip. So after we've eaten out at a restaurant, we want to be able to calculate what the tip should be. And based on the call sites, Alice believes that the full amount and the country code is what's required in order to calculate the tip. However, quite a while ago, Bill has refactored this function and completely removed the country code. So it's now just a constant, but didn't update all the call sites. And now Alice is getting really weird results whenever she's trying to change the country code, but still getting the exact same amount back. And it's very confusing. The next one I call, you wanted a cat, but you got one without a tail. What am I on about here? Let's say we have a main application and we also have a cat service, which is a microservice. And we want to be able to generate cats. So the main application needs to send a request to our cat service via the cat service API and uh, provide some configuration to get back a cat. And let's say this is what our cat type looks like. So we have an interface cat that extends an animal. So that means it has all the properties of an animal. And then it also adds some properties on top or some time to overrides. So here we have a cat that has a tail, some whiskers, some cat meta. And the cat meta is whether the cat is vaccinated or not, given name and a favorite snack. And the animal itself is something basic like ears, eyes, paws, and coloring, which is ginger mixed or black. And in order to create our cat, this is what the API request needs to look like. So the body needs to have the cat meta and then the cat settings where we care about the color. And this is our function. So we're now ready to create our cat service uh, <clears throat> cat request. And we're using the type here for cute cat as a cat. As soon as we've added the type, we're going to get an error. And that's because brown is not a color that's allowed here. We need to pick from ginger mixed or black. So let's quickly fix that up. OK, so we're creating an animal with name of Fluffy and the color ginger. So let's take a look on the other side. Now that this request is ready to go, what do we do with it once it arrives in that cat service? So on the other side, we're extracting some information from the body, the cat settings and the cat meta, and we're returning a new cat. Let's just make sure that it's you know using the same types all around. So let's reuse our cat type in this service as well. So we're now saying that cat data is of type cat. And of course, we're going to get an error again. And that's because the property tail is actually missing here. So the whole time we thought we were generating adorable little kittens, we were actually creating little tailless monsters. With TypeScript, refactoring has become so much easier. You can also ensure that you have better mock boundaries by reusing the types between the tests and the different services that you have. TypeScript also forces you to think about the wider context. And that's because you can't type the data structure just where you are working in. In order to make sure that that type is correct, you will be forced to look at all the instances of where that data structure is used. 
and then create a type that makes sense. Also, as you're doing this, you're going to start noticing perhaps properties that get annotated onto the data structures along the way, or things that get removed or deleted. And it's going to make you question whether that should be allowed or not. And that, in the end, also leads to improved architecture overall. So thanks to TypeScript, our code has never been in a better shape. And I actually can't imagine not using TypeScript anymore. Thank you.